Hello everyone and welcome to QuantPy. We're going to derive the diffusion equation now and we're going to follow the Einstein approach that he came up with in 1905. Long time ago, but gold stays with us, doesn't it? By the way, Lucy was only a few steps away from the diffusion equation when she was explaining the Brownian motion, but she had other things to do so she didn't quite get that. You know what it's like, you got to stick to the purpose. Anyways, that gives us an excuse for a fresh look, so let's get cracking. Remember we showed the Brownian particle in the 3D container filled with a liquid? And we then changed the view to 2D. We are now going to simplify it further by taking a one-dimensional view. Let's say we are interested in the motion along the horizontal axis. Let's say we dropped n Brownian particles in the liquid. Remember this rectangle represents a view of the container which contains a liquid and now the container has the particles suspended in the liquid. Let's represent a generic point along the horizontal axis by x. Let f represents the number of particles at location x at time t. So the number of particles in the small region of width dx will be equal to fx times dx. Now as time moves the number of particles in this region will change because the Brownian particles will move about because of bombardment by the molecules of the liquid. Some particles will move out of the region while other particles will move in. The movements of the particles in the molecules is quite complicated because of the magnitudes involved. If the liquid is a, say, water, then we know from the Avogadro's constant that each mole, which is about 18 gram, this is roughly speaking 300 to 400 drops of water, contains an enormous number of molecules and each Brownian particles will be experiencing about 100 trillion collisions in a second. By the way, this is about the number of cells in a human body, including the bacteria. This madness, right? So we're not going to attempt to solve that kind of system. So Einstein had to think and this is what he did. So you're going to ask what did he come up with? Well, he changed the perspective from deterministic to statistical or probabilistic. His approach is brutally simple, it just mingles the discrete and continuous settings and the right amount and this forms the very beginning of the stochastic modeling. Let's see the details because it's beautiful. So we have the distribution of particles at time t. Now let's consider a time step of length tau which we assume to be small but not too small so that the movements of a particle and two intervals can be considered independent. It's reasonable to assume that the movement of different particles are also independent. The Einstein probabilistic approach was to model the distance traveled by a particle or displacement of a particle in the small interval as a random variable. So the displacement that a particle experiences in an interval is the random variable. If the time interval is small, then one would expect larger probability of small movements and the probability will tail up as the displacement increases. Now to determine how many particles will end up in the area enclosed in the red, we can approach it as follows. So let's start at the right hand, a distance of delta from the point of interest. We can represent the number of particles by the same symbols. So we now have x plus delta as the first argument because the point is delta away from x and the total number of particles in this new enclosed area will again be just the value of f at the new location times dx. Now if we represent the probability of displacement by phi, so phi of delta would mean the probability of a particle experiencing a displacement of delta. Then the number of particles at x plus delta that will move to x will be the number of particles at x plus delta times the probability of displacement equal to delta. This is because the particles are delta distance away from x, right? So they need to experience a displacement of delta to end up at x. 
and we just need to take the number of particles and multiply it by the probability to get the expected number of particles that will end up at x. We can then move along the horizontal axis and apply the same logic to the whole horizontal axis. So the delta is shrinking and we cover the whole axis to the right of point x. We can apply the same logic to the left hand side. Remember the points to the left of x would be x minus delta because delta just represents the distance of a point from x. So it will take positive values to the right of x and negative values to the left of x because x is our base right. It would be reasonable to assume that the probability of displacement is symmetric, which is the same thing that the particle is equally likely to move to the left and right, though we would expect the probability to decline with the size of the shift. Small movements are more likely than large movements in a small amount of time. By the way, it's possible that a particle undergoes two movements in a small interval. For example, a particle can move from x plus delta to, say, x plus 2 delta and then move to x, but we're ignoring these higher order moments, or you can assume that the probability only reflects net displacement in an interval. Now, if we integrate these moments into x across the line, then we get the number of particles at location x at a later time, t plus star. Now, we can get rid of dx. Now, we can expand the left hand side using Taylor series. We do know that f depends on x and t, but when we write the derivative, we don't explicitly write the arguments to avoid clutter, though they are always there, if implicitly. As star is assumed to be small, we can ignore the higher order terms. We can expand the right hand side using Taylor series as well. We ignore terms higher than the second order because their contribution is going to be small. And the reason we keeping up to second order will become clearer as we get to know more about stochastic modeling in the future videos. Now we can substitute these into the expression to get. We can now expand the terms on the right hand side. By the way, f doesn't depend on delta, so we can take it out of the integral. Now because the probability of displacement is symmetric around zero, the negative and positive displacements are equally likely, which means the second term is zero. And we know the total probability is equal to one, so if you integrate the density with the whole line, you should get one, so we get. Now we can cancel the f on both sides, and then shift tau to the right hand side. And if we represent the integral by d, we get the diffusion equation. So we have the microscopic interpretation of the diffusion coefficient. So it's just like the average of the displacement squared, right? Now the larger the d, the faster will the Brownian particles move. Now it's easy to see that the diffusion coefficient d will depend on the size of the particle, temperature and properties of the liquid. Things will be moving about faster at higher temperature, for example and bigger particles are likely to move less than smaller particles. Now to see what this equation means in terms of the distribution of the Brownian particles across the x-axis, let's replace the derivative by the finite difference approximation. We can rearrange the terms on the right hand side to get. Let's bring back the diagram and the functions that represent the number of particles at different locations at a given time. So the left hand side is just the change in the number of particles at location x with respect to time. And the right hand side is telling us that if the average number of particles around the point x is higher than the number of particles at point x, then we shall see the number of particles at x increasing with time. And if the average number of particles to the left and right of x is smaller, then we shall be seeing the number of particles at x decreasing. I hope you enjoyed the video and I look forward to seeing you in the next.